everyone. Uh, I am Terry Gilman and I'm the owner of Creating Conversations and I am delighted to welcome you to our program tonight. Uh, tonight's program is possible because of the support and partnership between Creating Conversations and the Literary Women of Long Beach. Uh, together we have created this series, which we call Creating Conversations with Literary Women, um, des and designed it to introduce you to authors whose books we admire. Um, before I continue, I just need to say one quick word about those of you waiting for the paperback edition of Long Bright River. I do apologize for the delay. There was a slight hiccup at the publisher, but all of the books have been uh, received by the bookstore and uh, everyone who ordered prior to yesterday, your books are on their way to you. For the rest of you, uh, books will be mailed uh, next, early next week. So again, thank you for joining us for our third conversation in this series. Uh, I'm just thrilled to be hosting Pam Atherton in conversation with Liz Moore as they discuss Long Bright River, which is one of my favorite books from 2020. And now I wanna turn the program over to Barbara Wild. She is the chair of Literary Women and she will introduce you to our guests. Thanks, Terry. I'm really excited to be here and thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the third in our virtual presentations called Creating Conversations with Literary Women and I am the chair of Literary Women. Normally at this time of year, we are in a flurry of getting ready for our in-person festival. And I'm sure many of you have faithfully attended. Uh, we all miss that, but we've had to adapt to a virtual framework um, in collaboration with Creating Conversations and we're very thankful we're able to do this. This format allows us to continue with our mission to both support contemporary women authors and support our independent book supplier, who is Creating Conversations. I, I know you've met them at the festival. At this time, literary women would like to extend some thank yous. First to the Port of Long Beach for supporting our Harriet Williams Emerging Writers Program, which um, uh, provides a platform for new authors of talent and diversity. And in fact, um, the port is responsible also for uh, supporting our program tonight. Also, we'd like to thank the Arts Council for Long Beach through their community project grant um, they are also supporting this program. So yes, there's lots of intertwining support and it comes from many directions and also from you. So thanks for being here. Tonight, we're fortunate to have the talented Liz Moore, author of Long Bright River, which is listed as a literary mystery, but for those who've read it, we know that it is way more than that. Um, she'll be in conversation with Pam Atherton. If you've been here before, you know, you know that she's a notable radio personality. And she's interviewed many people with whom we are probably familiar, like Cher and Leslie Stahl. Um, but that's not her only talent. She's a seminar leader, a keynote speaker, and she lends her expertise to many organizations. But especially to those near to her heart. And for that, we're very grateful to her generosity. But I think her real talent is that she puts us all at ease. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Pam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. And thank you to Creating Conversations and to Literary Women for creating this new way to connect, especially during this time of the pandemic. I've got some housekeeping that I need to do before we get started. Just to let you know, there is a chat box on the side and we would love for you to chat amongst yourselves, um, uh, put whatever you want in there, get information in there, but that's not where we're gonna do the Q&A. There's an actual section at the bottom called Q&A and that's the only place we'll take questions from because the chat goes so fast, I can't keep up with it. So we'll just do the Q&A and make sure your questions are there. We're gonna do that at the end of the program after Liz and I talk for a little bit, then uh, we'll be taking your questions there. And there's also a raise your hand function. We're gonna ignore that too. 
So uh, just comment in the chat box. And in the chat box, you will also find a link from Creating Conversations, which will have a way for you to purchase the book in the formats of softback, ebook, and also as an audiobook. So keep an eye on the chat function several times during the evening. She'll go ahead and put that information down from there. So the other, th oh, and also if you have joined this and don't have a copy of the book yet, your uh, admission, your $5 will be credited towards the, co the uh, cost of the book. So that's a little extra bonus uh, from creating conversations. And if they happen to have any signed book plates, first come first serve that will get the assigned book plates. Uh, you're going to get an email after the event, <clears throat> and it's also going to let you know how to watch this um, uh, up about a month or so after they'll have a copy of this up there. There'll be information, there'll be codes, links, things like that. So be prepared to get that and recognize that this is a live event. So there may be dogs barking, there may be cats walking across keyboards, there may be doorbells ringing. It's a real live event in live time. So having said that, I look forward tonight to having a good conversation and a lot of laughs with Liz Moore. But before we begin, I wanna brag a little bit about Liz. This is her fourth novel. The other ones are The, Word of Every, the Words of Every Song, Heft, The Unseen World, uh, and this one, of course, A Long Bright River. And it's one of Barack Obama's favorite books of the year, named a best book of the year by NPR, Parade, Real Simple, and Buzzfeed. It was an immediate New York Times bestseller, and the January pick for Good Morning America's book club. How Liz keeps up with all of that, I have no idea. She also got some very strong endorsements from her book, and I want to just read a couple of those quickly. Lee Child, who is the author of the Reacher series, says, tough, tense, and twisty, but tender, human, and deeply affecting too. I don't have a sister, but when I finished the book, I called my brother just to hear his voice. And one that comes from Beth Macy, who is the author of Dope Sick, she says, truly, this is a great literary novel about a city in the age of opioids and two sisters navigating their past in the tradition of many great literary thrillers. I promise you, you will not see the end coming. So we are so thrilled to have Liz with us here today. Liz, thank you so much for being part of our Creating Conversations. Thank you so much for having me and, uh, and for interviewing me as well, Pam. I appreciate it. I want to know, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people do, Long Bright River, what, what's that mean? So the phrase Long Bright River um, is one that actually came pretty late to me um, in the writing process. In fact, I had a complete draft of the book um, finished before I had a really good title for it. And at a certain point, I realized I would have to find one. So I went on a search for every work I could find that related in any way to addiction. So I read a, a lot of poems, I listened to songs, I read um, novels and articles. And um, in, in the course of that process, I came across a poem by Tennyson called The Lotus Eaters, um, which contained the phrase Long Bright River um, in reference to the feeling of being kind of under the spell of um, opium. And I, I loved it. I thought it was um, poetic and I liked the sound of the words together. And then from there, I sort of retrofitted into a few different places in the book. Um, it's the, that poem is one of the two epigraphs that begin the book. And then the, the specific phrase, Long Bright River, I placed into a scene in which somebody is using heroin in reference to a, a vein. And um, it also refers to a long bright river of departed souls at the end of um, at the end of the book. Um, and of course, there's it also has a kind of resonance with the Delaware River, which is um, where the neighborhood of Kensington got its start. So let's talk about Kensington because for a lot of people like me who are originally from the West Coast, I don't know about the Kensington area. So explain that mm -hmm. to us. Sure. Um, I'm happy to, because I am also not from Kensington. I grew up um, in Massachusetts outside Boston. I lived in New York for a while um, and I only moved to Philadelphia in 2009. Um, I met my husband in New York and his family was from this area. And I also got a job um, teaching in Philadelphia in 2009. So when I first moved here, um, I was invited by a photographer friend um, named Jeffrey Stockbridge, who's a friend of my sister-in-law's, 
who was doing work in a neighborhood called Kensington, which I had never heard of. And he was making a series of portraits of the residents of Kensington, um, whom he described as um, really being in the throes of um, opioid addiction. In 2009, the neighborhood of Kensington and opioid addiction in general was not covered in the same way that it is today. And so when I arrived in Kensington, um, I was very um, sort of surprised by, by the openness of what I saw and also very moved by it. And um, Kensington itself, uh, to answer your, your initial question, has um, historically been a working class industrial neighborhood in Philadelphia that for a time was solidly I called it working class, but it was really part of middle-class Philadelphia um, for many, many generations. And it was the home of a lot of industry in Philadelphia. And then with the decline of American manufacturing as a whole from the 60s, 60s to the 90s, Kensington um, experienced that same economic decline, which led to a lot of abandoned homes um, and a lot of um, open use of pharmaceuticals, which you still see today. The, the twist at the end of all of it is, especially before the pandemic, Kensington, like a lot of working class neighborhoods in Philadelphia was also, was and is also rapidly gentrifying. So it's a neighborhood that's very much in transition. And like a lot of city neighborhoods, it's gone through a lot of ups, it's gone through downs, and now it seems to be uh, rapidly gentrifying for better or worse. When you worked with the photographer on the essays mm -hmm. to go with this, give us a feel of what you saw there in the streets and how it affected you. So my job, Jeff, the photographer invited me to come along um, to sort of take um, the oral histories of the people he was photographing and um, it was difficult for him because he was working with a, 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 a pretty big Hasselblad camera that he would put on a stand at, at a little bit of a remove from his subjects. And that made it difficult to um, converse with them the way he would want to. And also he was interested in um, making recordings of them when he had permission to do so, making recordings, uh, audio recordings of them and, and getting their stories. So. I was there, I only went with him a handful of times that summer. Um, I, I probably went about six times with him. Um, at, but each time I went, I really um, kind of got to know in intimate detail the life story of several of his subjects um, through speaking with them. And um, that was remarkable. Um, I think, you know, uh, a lot of people were actually quite interested in speaking with um, Jeff, partly because it was just sort of a break in routine. Um, and uh, I, I sensed that as well. It was sort of, there was a lot of curiosity about what he was doing. You know, he'd set up shop on a corner with a big old fashioned looking camera and people would sort of be drawn to him and say, what are you doing? Why are you here? And it, it was kind of a natural process from there of like beginning to have conversations with people. Um, he, he continued that work for a decade afterward. He really has become known in Philadelphia and uh, beyond Philadelphia. Um, his work has been shown overseas as well. Um, he, he has dedicated a huge part of his life's work to making photographs in, Phil in uh, Kensington. And I, separately from Jeff, began returning to the neighborhood for various reasons, uh, including to do community work. So in many years later in like 2017, 2018, I began doing, um, leading free writing workshops at a women's day shelter on Kensington Avenue, um, where I had contact with um, women who came in during the day, just seeking a, you know, a break, seeking a rest, seeking to do their laundry in the laundry machines or get a meal or whatever, just to get off the streets for a little bit. And so, um, you know, I, I sort of, those experiences, um, all of those experiences combined formed part of the initial um, seed of Long Bright River along with um, a limited set of autobiographical experiences and including the fact that my own family has a, a history of addiction although it looks different in many ways than the addiction in Long Bright River. 
do you think that creating this book as a suspense or a thriller or a mystery allowed you to speak more about the cultural situation, the social commentary of what was going on than if you were to write a book that was strictly about the opioid epidemic? So it's interesting. I This is my fourth no, published novel. Um, and the first novel of mine that's ever been marketed as um, a thriller, or I can't remember the term, that, um, that, that you used at the start, maybe literary suspense or literary right. mystery or something like that, whatever people call it. It's the first of my books that has been marketed as such, but it's always been my instinct as a writer to include a strong element of suspense in my books. Um, the two books I published prior to this one were called Heft and The Unseen World. And both of those included what I would call family mysteries, mysteries of parentage or identity or um, or uh, sort of intentional obfuscation of one's own identity. Um, and, uh, and, and characters had to work very hard to figure out like what was going on and why. So I've always, I've always writ instinctively written in a kind of mysterious or suspenseful way. And even with Long Bright River, my initial, my earliest work on it was in the form of a short story that I wrote in probably like 2012 or 2013 that had the characters of Mickey and Casey, but there was an important difference in, the, in that Mickey was not a police officer in that story. She was a teacher, a high school teacher. And um, I wrote that complete story and never published it. And I knew that it wasn't successful in some way. Um, and I decided that it was, the reason it wasn't successful is because it was lacking some sort of narrative tension or there wasn't enough propulsion to it. And so when I began to think about expanding it into a novel, I thought, well, how can I make these sisters even more different? How can I make them true foils for one another? Uh, working on in sort of what is the, uh, is the force that will drive them apart completely? And I thought if Mickey's a police officer and her job is to patrol the same district that Casey inhabits and in which Casey does sex work and um, you know uses heroin and um, in in essence like commits some of the crimes that Mickey would be patrolling for then all of a sudden you have a huge amount of narrative tension and also all of a sudden you have a, a police procedural or literary suspense and people begin to think of it in that light um, so the the I love detective fiction and, and suspense and thrillers, um, but I kind of backed into the genre, um, you know, with like one decision, I found myself in that genre. And then I really decided to embrace it and to kind of pay homage to a lot of the work I love to read in that genre and to use some of the conventions of that genre and to, you know, to, to, to do certain things I think differently than, um, than is sometimes done in the genre. So all those years of watching Law and Order paid off. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so for those who don't have the book, because it was a sellout, I mean, it, it was flying out the door and then you couldn't get the book. Do explain a little bit, I, I'm afraid to, because I'm afraid I'm gonna give something away. So I'd like you to explain a little bit about the book. Sure, the non-spoiler uh, version is that Long Bay River is the story of two sisters who grow up in a neighborhood of Philadelphia that's adjacent to Kensington. Um, Kensington, as I, as I have said, is uh, a neighborhood in Philadelphia and the US that's been really hard hit by the opioid crisis and a neighborhood in which um, sex work occurs pretty openly as a means of getting a fix. Um, and uh, the, the two sisters were quite close growing up um, they lost their parents to addiction and therefore they were raised by their grandmother. Um, and they have this very strong bond because of their shared traumatic childhood. Um, but they've gone in really two different directions as adults. And Mickey, the older sister, has become a police officer who patrols the district that includes Kensington. And her younger sister, Casey, has um, followed her parents into addiction and she's in active addiction as the book opens. Um, and she also, uh, it, it will give nothing away because it happens pretty early on in the book. 
she goes missing at the start of the book um, at the same time that a series of murders of women who fit her demographic is occurring in the neighborhood of Kensington. And so Mickey has to um, overcome the tension that exists between them, the estrangement that exists between them in their adulthood in order to start searching for her sister at first on the job and then subsequently off the job, which gets her into some precarious situations. You have two uh, themes in the book that are very high, hot, I should say right now. And I mean, hot, like they're dangerous. And that is police corruption and mm -hmm. the effect of addiction on the family. Because we have this tendency in our judgmental way to think, well, that's the person who has the addiction. That's their choice. Have a nice day. But that's mm -hmm. not really what happens. You explain a little bit and, and share with us that concept of how it does affect the entire family. Yeah, um, Mickey, especially at the start of the novel, so it's, a, it's um, narrated in the first person by Mickey. And so we get her point of view. And at first it's actually a fairly um, judgmental point of view, but also one that's I think pretty common or at least historically has been. Um, and her point of view is basically, you know, I made all the right choices. My sister made all the wrong choices. We, you know, I won't put up with her antics anymore. I've cut her off to preserve my own well-being. Uh, and, um, you know, we grew up in the same household, so she really has no excuse. Now, all of that becomes incredibly complicated over the course of the book as we begin to learn more about Mickey and, and the actions that she has taken in her life, some of which may have harmed others directly or indirectly. Um, and also as we learn more about the circumstances surrounding the sister's birth and childhood. Um, and I think it's it was and is incredibly important to me to portray addiction as the nuanced issue that it is um, because I fundamentally reject the idea of addiction as a moral failing. Um, and I think it's very important to understand all of the societal forces that go into an individual addiction, including um, a, a generation of, of corruption and lies at, uh, on the part of um, the pharmaceutical company that was widely distributing medications specifically OxyContin um, beginning in 1996. And I, I probably don't have to go into all the details of that. It's been a major you know, lawsuit um, at the national level. Um, but uh, yeah, there was, there was a, a concentrated effort to, um, to diminish how addictive um, uh, OxyContin and other opioid medication was. Um, for a couple of decades until we began to realize the huge addictive potential it had, at which point it was too late. Um, so it was important to me to, uh, to portray um, people with substance use disorder as having a disease, which I think that substance use disorder is. And I think too that the, um, the effect that it has on the family unit and the generations is something we don't think about. The people who are constantly worried as Mickey is, where's my sister? Where's my sister? Mm -hmm. um, the babies who are born um, addicted, you know, mm -hmm. and that it sometimes is a very generational thing. I think I've heard mm -hmm. you even say that, um, you know, you've had gener within your family, there's been, you know, generations of it. I know within my own with, with alcohol addiction, there has been mm -hmm. that in there. And mm -hmm. we tend to shy away from that because we want to make it a black and white issue of, you know, mm -hmm. no drugs good, drugs bad. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I think you found a way to kind of work around that so that we aren't feeling black or white about this situation. Yeah, you, you put that really well. I think with this book and with the, the, the question of addiction in general, it is possible to hold two truths simultaneously that, that seem to oppose one another. And that is that addiction is a disease. Um, and that, that we really should try to take, you know, moralizing out of our assessment of it. And also that it can really harm others within a family unit. It can harm the children of people with addiction. It can harm the parents of people with addiction, the siblings of people with addiction. You know, both of these things can be true. You know, we don't, we don't necessarily have to say 
one is at fault and the other is blameless. Um, so that's, I think I was trying to, to navigate that tightrope as I, as I wrote the book. Well, and you, you also I, asked about police corruption, which yes, that's I'm exactly happy to where talk I was going. Yeah, yeah. So I, in during the time that I've spent in Kensington, um, very early on, I began hearing stories from, um, especially the women that we interviewed about um, times that they had been um, taken advantage of at minimum or or sexually assaulted by certain police officers in Kensington, usually in a situation such as, you know, if you do this sexual favor, I will not take you down to the station. Um, for a long time, um, we had no, no formal record of that. There was nothing that had been published on, on record that I could find until after I had completed a, a draft of the novel. Um, uh, at which point in September of 2019, the Philadelphia Inquirer, our local paper, obtained access to um, internal police documents, internal police uh, disciplinary files within the Philadelphia Police Department um, that revealed some of the offenses that um, police had been placed on suspension for, including a couple of situations that were published that closely mirrored um, what we were hearing in Kensington. So the fact that police sexual assault happens in Kensington is not really up for debate. That is a, a fact that that happens that is documented not only by the Inquirer, but also the, the Philadelphia Police Department itself. Um, and so, you know, you you called police corruption like a hot a hot issue or a hot button issue. And it, it certainly is. And I know it can be an incredibly polarizing one, especially for people with friends and family um, who may be police officers, for example. Um, and what I would say is I think every police officer also knows that, that there are some bad police officers doing police work, right? There's no, there's no room for debate on that as well. And so my, what I hoped to portray in Long Bright River was a sense of uh, the idea that policing as a whole probably needs to have a reckoning with the way it um, has historically sheltered um, people who have uh, acted badly um, or acted immorally or acted illegally within its departments, with, uh, within its, you know, yeah, within, within various departments um, here in Philadelphia and elsewhere. Um, so that's what I'll say about that. I would think that there are people who read this book and say, oh, that's my neighborhood. Right, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because it's not. I th I don't think Kensington. Do you think Kensington's an anomaly? In terms of um, like policing in Kensington or opioid well, use in Kensington, the opioid or... use, the the police, yeah, and what's no. going on? Mm -hmm. You don't so, uh, definitely that's not. Happening. I mean, there's 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 both both issues occur widely all over the United States for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right, so I want to talk now a little bit about you writing the book, because sure. something that a lot of people, are, the first thing they notice is, hey, there's no quote marks in this book. What was <laughs> your reason for choosing that? Um, I occasionally write in this style. Um, in my book, Heft, one character um, used quotation mark. That was two first person points of view. And one character used quotation marks and the other didn't. And um, when I'm writing in the first person voice of a character that I think of as quiet in some way, or if I, I think of both Mickey and the character from Heft um, that I'm thinking of as almost sort of speaking very lowly or muttering in some way or having a sort of muted quality to their, their speech, being very internal. I didn't love the look of the announcement that um, there's, it's kind of like a fanfare on the page every time quotation marks are used. I liked the relatively quieter um, appearance of the, the dashes that, that designate dialogue in Long Bright River. And I, this is a topic of conversation that you're right has come up a lot with Long Bright River. And I always feel like I need to, to say that I, can't it, it that the tradition of using dashes instead of 
quotation marks is certainly not one I invented. It's a longstanding tradition in literature. Um, a lot of English and Irish authors, for example, use dashes instead of quotation marks all the way back to, for example, James Joyce. I'm not comparing myself to James Joyce, but you know, he, he did it and many um, Irish authors subsequently did it. Um, I like Irish literature um, and uh, maybe reading it when I was young informed that decision a little bit too. Um, yeah. I was gonna say, I found for me as I was reading it, that it's written the way I'm a voice person. So uh, mm -hmm. I do voice acting. And so I would catch cool. myself reading out loud some of it because it was done mm -hmm. so conversationally. Well, then we mm -hmm. said this, and then he said that, and she said this, and I said that, and we said this, and I don't mm -hmm. know. You know, so mm -hmm. it was written like somebody's stream of consciousness thinking. And I liked that because then it wasn't so, like you said, set off by the quotes where it's, he said this, she said that, he said this. It was, you know, more like very stream of consciousness. So I found that. Yeah, there funny. is there is sort of a spoken quality to um, to Mickey's voice more than a written quality. And I think that is how people tell stories. It's sort of like, and then he said this and I said that, but then he said this. And, you know, it's like I wanted that kind of spoken aloud quality. Yeah, it's kind of a storytelling thing where mm -hmm. you feel like they're mm -hmm. talking directly to you when they say those things. Mm -hmm. You also yeah. use the device of the then and the now. Did that yeah. cause any kind of problems for you when you were writing? No, I mean, I think um, at first I was playing around with doing like specific year numbers because some of the then sections were set way back in the past, you know, like 15 or 20 years earlier than the present of the narrative. And some of the then sections were set much more recently, either in like Mickey and Casey's late adolescence or in their, their early 20s. And that got way too confusing and nobody was going to be able to keep track of, wait, are we in, you know, are we in 2001? Are we in 1999? Are we in 2007? I don't know how old they are. So eventually I just um, decided to, to lump all the sections in the past as into sections called then. And basically I told them in chronological order, order from the beginning of the girl's childhood until um, a climactic moment that I will be cognizant not to spoil, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, that was, um, that was my decision after, after months or years of wrangling with like, am I going to use your numbers? Am I going to not say anything? That was a, a bit of guidance, at least, or uh, orientation for the reader. Let's talk a little too bit specific. about your research as well. I mean, obviously you had spent some time in Kensington, but the minute you decided to make it a police procedural, you know, law and order can only go so far. So what did you yeah. do to research all these things? That is so true. I found myself at such a loss for kind of like the daily ins and outs of police work when I was in, in the early stages of writing the book. So I requested and was granted a ride along with um, a member of the Philadelphia Police Department Although I requested a ride along in Kensington and was granted a ride along in Fishtown, which is the neighborhood adjacent to Kensington, which is also much lower in crime. And I also, um, the officer assigned to me was a community relations officer. Um, so I imagine that there was a little bit of like management of image g going on there. On the other hand, he had worked for many years as a patrol officer prior to becoming a community relations officer. So he was extremely helpful in telling me I, you know, I asked him questions like, what would a typical shift look like from beginning to end? What are all the actions that a person would take upon getting into her vehicle and getting out of her vehicle? What, are, what does it sound like when a call comes through the radio? What is this weird little console in the middle of your cruiser and what does it do and what is it called? And you know, these are all things that, you, that no amount of Googling would ever get you especially like you can find police forums online, but I wanted police forums that were, or police information that was specific to the PPD itself. Um, so, you know, when you get to that level of specificity, you really need to talk to someone directly. In addition to that ride along, I, my husband has two friends who are a father and a son. The son is a police officer outside Philadelphia and the father is a retired member of the, of the Philadelphia Police Department. And they both granted me telephone interviews. And then finally, I, I found a female police officer, again, not a member of the Philadelphia Police uh, Department, but it was important to me to talk to a woman who had done 
police work um, to get her perspective. And I had a telephone interview with her as well. So that was all the stuff I did on police work along with a lot of Googling. Do you think there will be, or have there, has there been any changes because of your book? I honestly doubt that there have been changes specifically in response to my book. Um, partly it because my book- eyes? I, I think, I, I, I have a difficult time answering that question. I mean, my gut instinct is no, uh, partly just because uh, my husband always, te- you know, before the book came out, both of us were like, oh, do you think we're going to get on like the blacklist of the PPD in Philadelphia? And we were kind of joking about it. And then my husband made the point, like even books that are bestsellers are still not widely read by society as a whole. Like I, I have no idea how many people in the city of Philadelphia have, have read Long Great River, but my guess is like not all that many. So if it becomes a television series, which it may, then maybe we'll hear some more about, um, we'll hear some more reactions from um, not, not just police officers, but, but, you know, people in general, but I also just think policy takes a very, very long time to change. Um, but maybe don't you think something like your book is what helps to start policy to change. That would be great if it did, if it, if it helped to affect policies that would reduce harm um, within Kensington and other uh, neighborhoods like it. I, I, um, I would be very pleased by that idea. Um, although, again, I imagine that it's like community workers on the ground who've been grinding away for, for generations doing, doing the work on foot that would really have the, have more, you know, claim to any changes that, that took place. I want to drift back a little bit to when you said the TV show, because this has been optioned, hasn't it, the book? Yeah, the book was optioned um, and uh, we are close to being able to make an announcement about what shape it's taking. As uh, you can but, tell us, yeah. we're not gonna tell anybody. So go ahead and <laughs> tell us. Only 108 of you. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I could, I, I really wish I could. I'm growing impatient to be able to like share the news but things take forever. You probably know this Pam, if you, if you kind of work in and around like any branch of, of show business. It just, I don't know. To, I don't know if it's the pandemic or what, but it feels like things are moving a little slowly. Well, and here's what I think, and I could be way wrong, mm-hmm. but you just go ahead and nod your head if I'm right. So you're not really telling us. <laughs> I get the feel that this is going to be a several episode. This is not going to be a movie, that this is going to be a several episode kind of thing, like an HBO, the way The Wire was, along those lines. Am I probably <laughs> right in what I'm thinking? You're not, you're not, not right. <laughs> you can puzzle that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's when I was reading the book, I thought to myself, mm-hmm. oh, this could be done in that same mm-hmm. manner. So maybe the first, you know, like the Brits do six episodes in a, in a mm-hmm. series, right? A session. And, you know, it's one crime. Well, this is the crime of looking for the sister. So mm. then now you come up with something else for the next one. So I could see this definitely being something long-term along the line of, of the wire. So good for if you, you. If you, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, you're, you can start some rumors on the, your coast and see if anybody <laughs> like gets say, a move on. Been cast yet in that Liz Moore project? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and we'll go yeah. from there. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about your writing and your style and stuff, because uh, a lot of people on here not only are avid readers, but they're also um, authors and, you know, also wanting to get into this field. So one of the questions I always ask is, are you a plotter or a pantser? Because there are authors who are who plot everything out and those who work by the seat of their pants. So (laughs) which one are you? The second one, um, I don't plot anything in advance. I just start writing. Typically, I know uh, I know who my main characters are, and I do a lot of scene scene work with them that I know will probably never make it into the book to try to understand them pretty well. I know who my characters are. I know where they are in place and time, um, and I have a very I need to have a very rich 
imaginative sense for their setting in order to feel inspired to write a book. And I know what their initial problem is, like what the inciting incident is. And other than that, I don't know how they'll solve the problem. I don't know, you know, what they'll, how they'll put their feet one in front of the other for the next 400 pages. And I just write forward and I skip around and write scenes whenever I feel inspired. And eventually it starts to take a shape and usually that shape is wrong. And then I have to go back and rewrite from the beginning. And I just make mistake after mistake after mistake for several years until at last it all sort of comes together at a certain point. Um, and that is why I tend to be on a four year publication schedule rather than some authors who are publish like a book every year, um, especially in, the, in this genre, in, in mystery or suspense, people tend to, I think, write faster than I do. And maybe I'll pick up the pace at some point, but it's not looking good right now. <laughs> How do you um, come up with the ideas for what the book will be about? Because the three books are all about different things. They're not related, yeah. I mean, other than family dynamics, but I mean, really. Yeah. Um, often I'll find myself very obsessively reading about something and watching documentaries about it and speaking to people with experience about it. And I get into this like real, it doesn't even feel like directed research. It just feels like a period of deep natural curiosity and exploration about a subject. And then at a certain point I realize what I'm doing and I realize, oh, this is going to be my next book. Um, and that's kind of it. I mean, I setting plays a huge role in all my books. Um, Heft was set in, in Brooklyn in Park Slope. My, I have a family history in, in my, my father's parents lived in Park Slope when I was growing up and I eventually lived in Park Slope um, when I was a young adult. Um, so it's set there, which that's a very resonant neighborhood for me with a lot of memories in it. The Unseen World was set in Boston, in specifically in Dorchester. Um, and I grew up on the outskirts of Boston, uh, but both of my parents worked in Boston and I had relatives living in Boston. Um, and then uh, Long Great River is set in Philadelphia, which is where I've lived now for, for 12 years. Um, my next book is also set someplace that I'm, that has a lot of kind of emotional resonance for me, but it's not any of those places. So my next book is not set in Philadelphia. So where will it be? Um, I can't, I can't say yet. Um, not until that, I know it's, you know, it's not that I'm in, well, with the, with the TV stuff, I contractually cannot say anything about it. With my own work, I've always found, and I think a lot of writers report this, that the more I talk about it, the less I want to write it. It sort of loses some of its energy or forward momentum if I spend too much time saying what it's about. And it also, I find boxes me in too early. Like if I say, this is my book set here, that's about this character, then I can't, it's almost like I can't go back on that because someone at a party, when parties were a thing, will come up and be like, hey, how's your book about cowboys or whatever? I'm not writing a book about cowboys. And I'll be like, oh, it's completely different now. You know, I just, I need to sort of work in this cl closet before I can really start speaking about it openly. So while even my husband doesn't look, know, by the way, I should say, even my husband doesn't know what I'm working on. While I go look in the Q&A box, I want you to tell everybody what, if you have a ritual when you write um, every day and what it is. Yeah, these days, my process has changed a lot over my career. Um, I am pretty disciplined these days. I have two little kids. I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old, and I teach full-time um, in Temple University's MFA program. And I'm adapting some of my work for the screen, and I'm writing a new novel. And so I really have to be careful to you know, produce words when it's time to do that. And so these days in this pandemic world, I write at home. I'm, I'm actually sitting at the, it's not even a desk. It's a table that I took from outside of my house and brought inside because, and this, and I'm sitting in a bedroom. So this is a very improvised pandemic setup because my husband works from home. I work from home. We have a babysitter now, thankfully, who comes in and watches our kids on the ground, like low, floor below me. 
Um, and every day I come here and I read first before my writing session begins. I read whatever I'm reading. It doesn't have to be research for the book. In fact, it usually isn't. Um, I read for about 30 minutes and then I start writing and I aim to write 500 words a day. And that's a new kind of rule for myself. I used to not have a goal for myself, but um, given how many things I'm doing at any given time, and I think post-parenthood, I have to really kind of encourage myself to write to a certain number or else I fall hopelessly behind. Um, and it's often a struggle. Sometimes it's not, but it is often a struggle to produce those 500 words. And that's my routine. When I'm done, I turn off, you know, I, I stop writing and I let myself off the hook and I turn to my other work and to my kids and I never oh. push. Yeah. Unless I'm at the very end of a novel, like the, the writing process of a novel, sometimes I'll get bursts of energy where, or inspiration where I can write, you know, a couple thousand words in a day. But usually it's like those 500 words are a struggle and I'm done when I'm done. Yeah. Okay. So questions here. This comes from Kim O'Connell. Liz, how much, if any of the relationship between the sisters mirrors a relationship in your own life? So, I have a sister, I have a younger sister um, who is not in any way like Casey, um, uh, but we are very close. Um, we are still very close. We have also never had a falling out the way that the sisters did. But um, I was very protective of her um, when we were kids, partly because she's a lot younger than I am. She's seven years younger than I am. So I felt always like a third parent to her almost as much as a sibling. And I think that's the sense that Mickey has for Casey when they're growing up. She feels very parental toward her. So the emotional energy of that sisterly relationship, although my, my sister is very like high functioning um, and, and does not have a lot in common with Casey, my sort of love for her and my protectiveness of her comes probably is revealed in Mickey. All right, this one comes from Dr. Mary Ayala. The book ended uh, litany of names as a hook really pulled me into the novel. What inspired that decision? And that names actually is that at the front and at the back. What inspired that decision? Yeah, that list of names, I should be, be sure to say they're all fictional, they're invented names, um, but they are uh, in speaking with a lot of people in Kensington over the years, I have noticed that very sadly, many of them can sort of rattle off a list of names like that, a, a list of the names of all the people that they've known who they've lost to opioid addiction. And it's just sort of a, um, a very matter of fact, you know, um, just almost like a, a roll call of people who've been lost. And, and I thought it was an interesting way to represent that visually and to kind of immediately um, bring the reader into the reality of how many people Mickey has known who, who have succumbed to opioid addiction. Um, and of course, at the end of the book, it takes on a, a slightly different meaning, but again, I won't talk about that specifically, but that's the, that was the meaning of it. Yeah. I want to share a little bit of background that Dr. Ayala gave us. <clears throat> She's a Philly girl herself. She's a Temple grad. And she said Hi. she has, um, she has friends with newfound family members who grew up in Kensington, Fishtown, and a young niece that she never met, a recovering addict who was murdered several years ago, and the murder is still unsolved. So this hits home. Uh, do you, is this something you think, I mean, is going to happen? People are going to go, oh, that's what happened to me, you know? Why isn't this, you know, do you think that that this will be a familiar story? Yeah, I mean, I've heard, um, I, I'm not surprised given how, how um, widespread um, opioid addiction is and how many families have been impacted by it. But um, I am always moved by the, the emails and letters that I get from um, people who, uh, relate to, to different aspects of the book, either people in addiction, people in active addiction, or people in recovery um, from addiction, or people with family members with addiction, or people who've lost um, friends and family members. I get correspondence from, you know, all of those groups, and um, I'm very moved by it, and 
when I was doing in-person events, I would also often meet people at those events, either who were um, in recovery from addiction or who had lost loved ones. Um, and that, that was also a, an extremely moving experience. Um, and I always felt this is something it's so long, it's been so long since I've done an in-person event that I can almost, it seems like another lifetime, but I, I recall the feeling of there's this terrible, like when you're signing books at the end of an event, usually a, an employee of the bookstore is doing their job, which is to make sure nobody's waiting in line for too long. And so they're kind of like ushering people through the line and like making sure the line moves. Um, but some of those conversations were extremely, you know, intense and um, extreme, clearly extremely painful for uh, the person divulging um, the information. And I always um, tried to get contact information for them and sort of follow up with them. And a few occasions when I wasn't able to do that because they left or, you know, those still, I still remember those people. Um, they made a big impression on me. So a great question coming from Brooke. She said, so curious to hear the story about Long Bright River being selected as one of Barack Obama's favorite books. How did that happen? I have no idea. I have no contact with him. It is a huge surprise. Uh, my publisher was taken off guard. I was too. Oftentimes with those lists, like best, best of lists, um, the publisher will get a heads up in advance. <clears throat> the author sometimes will as well but not with the President Obama's list. He just <laughs> posts it. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a hugely prolific user of social media, although I have a Twitter account and an Instagram and all that. But I, I think, I can't remember what day it was that it, it was posted. I think it was the busy day for me. I was teaching or something. So I hadn't been like checking Twitter frequently. And um about an hour after he posted it, I, I looked at Twitter and saw that I had like 800 notifications or something. And, and um, that's when I knew something either good or bad had happened because you never know. Um, and it turned out to be really a wonderful gift. Uh, unfortunately, because there was no advance notice, that's a big reason I think it, it sold out a lot of places. And Printers in general are deeply behind because of COVID. Like every industry, it's been <clears throat> the printing industry has been really hard hit by the pandemic, um, and so that's the reason for the lag. Is because Long Bright River sold out a lot of places, and they didn't, you know, they hadn't printed enough copies as they would have if they had known that this endorsement was coming. So that was a, it's you can't complain about it because it's such a <laughs> wonderful blessing, um, but. But yeah, if we had known, I think Riverhead might have printed a few more copies of it. Well, and I think they're, too, come, they're we arriving. When we were talking earlier about <laughs> policy changes and changing things mm -hmm. that are happening, I think this is a perfect example. Sure, the people on the ground are the ones who are going to be making sure that the changes happen, but it's somebody like Barack Obama reading this book to say, hey, mm -hmm. look, problem, let's all read this. And that's where I think you may not realize it as an author, but you may have made a huge effect on a lot of people. So that would be an honor if that were true. Yeah. Okay. So several people asked this question, Gregory and Heather and Allison. So they want to know about you as a, a young writer. How, when did you know you wanted to be an author? Did you always know you wanted to be an author? And when did you really st first start writing? Um, I wrote a lot in journals. Um, I wrote little poems when I was a kid. I tried to keep a diary, although I wasn't always disciplined about it. Um, I got to college and um, took a couple of creative writing courses I really loved, but I come from a family of um, half, half of my family is scientists. My, my dad actually is now mostly retired, but but had a whole career um, as a physicist. Um, and I think I always really admired his career and wanted to believe that I could follow in his footsteps into, into science. And so my, the earliest major that I declared in college was in the sciences. I, I declared a major in neuroscience and behavior. Um, and 
pretty quickly realized it wasn't a good choice because I was required to take pre-med level science courses, basic science courses. And I was really struggling to get like C's in them. I, I was just not equipped to excel in those science courses. Um, meanwhile, I was taking this wonderful short story writing course with the author, Mary Gordon, who some of you might know. Um, I went to Barnard College, which is where she still teaches. Um, and um, I loved it and I was so drawn to it. And I think I was really fighting against my gut feeling that maybe I should be pursuing creative writing um, because I had this very like practical side and the part of me was extremely scared to ever call myself a writer or to pursue it seriously. Um, but Mary was really encouraging and uh, she's part of the reason that I, I eventually as a junior switched to be English as my major, which meant I had to catch up in a lot of ways. But I was an English major uh, as I should have been to, from the beginning. And uh, I, I actually ended up publishing, my first novel was a, collection of interconnected short stories that I had begun at Barnard. And I published it a year or two after I graduated uh, and then kind of never looked back. I got my MFA in fiction. Um, I, during the course of my MFA, that's where I began Heft. I published Heft after that and I began teaching creative writing and, and it's become my, my full-time job. Um, but it but took me a, a while books. to believe I, I could do that, yeah. yeah. So uh, as we close out here, uh, final question here, what is it that you want people to take from this book? Uh, I, I hesitate to like, you know, come up with a, a moral because I think it, as I said earlier, I think in this book, I was grappling with two coexisting truths. One is that addiction is really, really hard on the people with addiction and the other is that addiction is really really hard on the people adjacent to them and both things are true you know um of course i hope that the book um fosters empathy for both parties um i hope the book allows us to see that the roots of addiction are complex and are societal um as much as they are individual um i hope we can remove um moralizing from our treatment of addiction and turn to scientific methods for treating addiction, including long-term um, MAT, medication assisted treatment, if that's what it takes. I think people are scared of it, but more and more studies show, unfortunately that the people with opi the best outcomes um, in opioid addiction often have to rely on MAT uh, for, for many years and in some cases permanently in order to recover um, or to get into long-term recovery. Um, so yeah, and also I just hope they remember the characters as real seeming people because they do seem real to me. Well, and they will be real in the Hollywood version of that. What is it again? <laughs> Okay, that was a good try, Pam. <laughs> that was a good try. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to keep track of that. All yeah. right. If you want to know more about Liz, you can follow her on Twitter. She's better at social media now. And it's <laughs> at Liz Moore Books. So you'll find it there. You can also find out more at her website, lizmore.net. She's also got some great um, essays that she's written in the past. I encourage you to read the one about how she um, met her husband. It's really a lovely story. So <laughs> please read that. Creating Conversations, who is the host here tonight, uh, is creatingconversations.org. And of course, Literary Women, another co-host, literarywomen.org. And you'll notice that in the chat box, they've been putting the links up to getting the ebook, getting the audiobook, and getting the paperbacks. So you will find those there. And again, if you did not have the book prior to tonight, your entrance fee will be used as a credit against uh, the purchase of a book and use the discount code. And it, you're actually gonna get an email that has the discount code in it. So if you don't have a paper or pencil handy right now, you don't need to write it down, but it's basically CCLW 2021. So 
uh, you will do that and that will go uh, towards that. By the way, if, if you know, we want to say thank you, independent bookstores are so important right now and creating conversations is one of those. And we hope that not only for this book, but for other books that you're thinking of purchasing, that you will go to creating conversations and check out their selection there because we need to support independent bookstores because they're the people behind events such as what we're doing tonight. So please remember creatingconversations.org is where you will go for that. And we want to say also thank you to everybody who's coming to Literary Women, to Creating Conversations, for creating this conversation that we've had to get to know Liz more better. Liz, thank you so much. Will you come back? Absolutely, yeah. When, whenever I actually finish this book I'm working on. But also, Pam, thank you so much for your questions, that you're such a graceful com orchestrator of conversation, and it was a real pleasure. Thanks thank for having me, and thanks to, for, to everyone for coming. Well, in the face of all of these Zoom events, it's it's very admirable that you all showed up. <laughs> and when that series comes out, we're going to have you back, no matter how important and big you are in Hollywood, you're going to come <laughs> back to talk about it. That sounds great. Okay. So Pam and Liz, on behalf of Literary Women, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who spent the hour with us. Thank you for coming. <laughs>